Hey YouTube, Turbin Dude here. I want to talk about the relative merits of the Garrett turboprop engine that I have on my Mitsubishi MU2 behind me. Uh, there's uh, several companies that have owned this design. I think it was uh, Air Research, Garrett, and I believe Honeywell is the current company that supports and sort of owns the type certificate and everything on this engine. Uh, relative merits of this engine versus say the the uh, PT6 Pratt & Whitney that's on a King Air. So this is a fixed shaft turbine design. It uh, tends to be more fuel efficient for a given power output than like what you'd find on a King Air. Anywhere from 10 to 15%, I believe, are the numbers that I've heard. Uh, again, fixed shaft design, so it does have to turn the whole engine rotating assembly and the propeller to get the engine up to speed for the start. So that is one of the disadvantages of this type of engine. It does take a massive amount of electrical power to turn the starter generator. I heard someone say the starter generator on this engine makes around 30 horsepower and it needs all of it to get that engine up to a speed where it's safe for it to light off and to help it accelerate up to self-sustaining speed. Uh, here in a minute, I'll uh, cut the video and I'll take you on a quick walk around of the engine. Uh, it is a really compact engine from a size standpoint. If you take away the exhaust pipe, the actual power producing section of the engine is only about that long. And the thermodynamic rating is 1,000 horsepower. Uh, my understanding of that as a layperson, not an engineer, is that on a perfect day at sea level, under standard temperature conditions, uh, it's capable of making 1,000 horsepower. So this airframe, they flat rated that to 724 horsepower. And what that means is the gearbox and the mounting to the airplane is really designed around that 724 horsepower number. And so you might ask, well, why do they bother having a thousand horsepower engine if you can only use 724? The answer to that is as you climb, the air gets thinner is the simple answer. Lower pressure so the engine has less airflow going through it. And so the power capability of the engine goes down as you climb higher and higher in the atmosphere. And that's universally true of almost every engine. So if you're starting out with, uh, it's a thousand horsepower engine, and you're only gonna run it to a max of 724, you can hold that 724 up to a much higher altitude than you could if it was a thermodynamically rated 724 horsepower engine. It would immediately start losing horsepower as you climbed, whereas this engine, can hold a higher amount of horsepower higher in the altitude where the air is thin. So the combination of that, holding more horsepower and the higher altitude where the air is thinner, allows this aircraft to get a really great true air speed. So your speed through the air, you know, how fast you're gonna be covering grounds uh, improves with these bigger engines. So I'm gonna cut the video here. I'll clip it together so there's no gap, but I'm gonna give you a quick walk around of what's under the cowlings on this engine. Enjoy. All right, here's the dime tour of a Garrett 331-10 engine. So there in the inlet, you can see what looks like a turbocharger compressor wheel if you're a car guy. You can see as I rotate the propeller off camera here that it turns that compressor wheel. I'm actually turning everything inside that engine all at the same time because it's all on one fixed shaft. Because as we discussed earlier, this is a fixed shaft turbine. Uh, that engine turns the propeller through a gearbox with about a 25 to 1 gear reduction ratio. So at 100% RPM on the gauge, that propeller is turning at 1,591 RPM. If you do the math, uh, roughly about 41,000 RPM on the engine itself. So that little compressor wheel that you're looking at earlier in the frame, turning around about 700 times a second as you're humming along in cruise. And that is where this engine likes to live. It, uh, does the best around 100% RPM. You can back it off a little bit to get a little bit of reduced fuel flow and reduced noise. Uh, but this engine really does the best when it's at a really high power setting and a really high altitude. So as the air gets thinner, of course, there's less air density going through the engine. And that means we can't burn quite as much fuel uh, without over the engine. So as you climb, you do lose horsepower on the engine. Uh, the side effect of that though is the thinner air uh, is less drag on the airframe. So you do gain efficiency as you climb in this airplane. Generally when I'm heavy, I'll start out about uh, 23,000 feet if I have lots of fuel or lots of passengers or both. Um, as you burn some of that fuel off, I generally work my, up to, my way up to about 25,000. 
And again, the higher you fly the airplane, the more efficient it is, is the general rule of thumb, uh, ignoring winds and other variables like that. Very efficient engine. It's a very tightly packaged engine. So this mint green section you see right here, forward, basically to the back of the propeller, that's the gearbox. And after that is the engine. So the power producing section of the engine starts at the back part of that mint green area right there. And it goes back to this section right here. So these are the power turbines in this section here. After this is just an empty tube. That's, a, that's the exhaust pipe. And I will stick the camera in there, but I'm not sure how good the exposure is going to be. It's pretty dark in there. So you can see the actual engine itself. The power producing section is about 30 inches long. And that's a thousand horsepower thermodynamic rating on that engine. Again, flat rated at 724 in this installation. But uh, it's a relatively small engine to make a really high power setting and it will really do it indefinitely. It's happy to make that much power as long as you feed it fuel. It, um, it's happy to hum along and sit there and make 700 horsepower all day if you keep feeding it fuel. Advantages to this over a regular aircraft engine, a regular being a piston aircraft engine, there's no reciprocating parts in this engine. That means nothing goes back and forth. Uh, everything is just rotates in the same direction, doesn't change direction at all to make power. And that's one of the reasons for the durability difference between this and a, and a piston engine and say a Cessna, like a 182 or something. Uh, the other thing with the turbine engine that you get, you can sort of just see the welds on this oil tank. The quality of hardware and the quality of all the switches and valves on it tends to be a lot higher quality than what you get on uh, a piston engine. And so turbine, air, turbine engines are phenomenally reliable if they're properly taken care of. Uh, there's two overhaul schemes for this engine. There's a 5,400 hour TBO, time between overhaul. So that's the manufacturer's recommended time of running the engine before you, they suggest that you overhaul it. I do say suggest, there's kind of a lot of nuance to that. Um, if you're running this as a private airplane, the overhauls are actually not mandatory, but between those overhauls um, on this engine is, is on the 5,400 hour scheme. Every 1,800 hours, it gets what's called a hot section inspection. And that's exactly what it sounds like. So from here back is where the fuel gets burned. So all the fire in the engine lifts from here to here, as long as everything's working properly. And so that is the hot section of the engine. So a hot section inspection entails removing the engine from the airplane and they split it right here in the middle and they take the whole hot section of the engine apart. All those little fan blades and everything in there, they measure with very precise measuring equipment and they make sure everything is within specification. So um, within that, if you were operating this airplane for hire, you would do a hot section at 1800, another hot section at 3600, and then at 5,400 hours, you would overhaul the engine. Since this is a private airplane, the overhaul is not mandatory, but the inspections are always mandatory. So that's sort of the simple answer, is that overhauls are not mandatory, inspections are always mandatory. Again, that's speaking to the Part 91 private flying side of the house where you're not charging anybody anything to ride on the airplane. Um, if it is uh, what we call a Part 135 air carrier, or somebody that you're paying to charter the airplane, they would have to overhaul it at the recommended time between overhaul that the manufacturer suggests. So a lot of nuance to that. You know, pilots will get to arguing about that for days on whether that's mandatory, but you know, that is the Cliff's notes on that. Uh, besides all those details, it's been a phenomenal engine for me. It makes a lot of power, smooth. It starts every time, even in cold weather. Uh, one disadvantage to this, since it is a fixed shaft turbine, it has to turn this whole propeller, the whole engine, and all the fans attached to it to start it. And so it has to run it up to a relatively high speed before it has enough airflow going through it um, until you can introduce fuel and light that fuel and start building the fire in the engine to get it started. And so I've been told the starter generator on this aircraft makes around 30 horsepower. So it's a pretty substantial electric motor they call it a starter generator on this engine because it starts the engine. Once the engine's running, it still rotates and it becomes a generator that recharges the batteries. 
So that is one of the main disadvantages of this fixed shaft turbine design. It takes a lot of electrical power to start. In cold weather, when the oil is thick, you pretty much need a ground power unit because the onboard batteries, when they're cold soaked, it's sort of iffy on whether they'll provide enough juice to uh, turn that starter generator, get the engine started properly. So GPU becomes mandatory in my book below about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, anyway, phenomenal engine, very reliable so far. Uh, I've heard it's around 10 to 15% more fuel efficient for a given power output compared to a Pratt & Whitney PT6. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's the Cliff's Notes on a TPE 331-10. Another quick view of the inlet. There is the P2T2 probe for the fuel controller. That style means you have the, not the Bendix, the Woodward fuel controller. So this has the updated fuel controllers on this engine. If you like what you heard here today, give me a like, share, or subscribe to my channel.